All right, today I'm doing another proof video, and this one is gonna be on the cube root of two. So the cube root of two is irrational, but how do we prove this? What we're gonna be doing today is we're gonna be proving that the cube root of two is irrational, but the way I'm gonna do it is by contradiction. So first we're gonna assume that the cube root of two is actually rational, and then we'll go from there. So assume that the cube root of 2 is actually rational. And we're going to be doing this by contradiction. So if the cube root of 2 is actually rational, then that means that we can write it as a fraction, because that's what rational means. You can write it as a ratio of two integers, which means Basically, you can write it as a fraction. So then what would happen is the cube root of 2 could be written as a fraction. Let's say p over q. So p over q both have to be integers. So we're going to say that they belong to the set of all integers. And we also have to say that the greatest common divisor of p and q is 1. And that just means that when I have p and q, um, they can't be simplified down anymore. So basically going to be a fraction that's in simplest form already. So the greatest common divisor of p and q is 1, and we cannot divide by 0, so q cannot be equal to 0. Okay? So now that we have that out of the way, we can use some quick algebra to kind of get the two bytes, right? But first, before I do that, I want to use a fact by the fundamental theorem of algebra. So by the fundamental theorem of algebra, we can say that p and q are both integers, which means that they can be broken down into prime factors. So we can say that p is equal to p1 to the power alpha 1 times p2 to the power alpha 2 all the way to pn with the power alpha n. And we can also say the same thing about q, right? We can say that q is equal to q1 to the power of beta 1 times q2 to the power of beta 2 all the way to q of n to the power of beta n. And we're going to say that all these alphas and all these betas are exponents, right? So they can be either zero or they can be greater than zero as exponents. And we also have to assume that all these p's and all these q's are going to be prime numbers because that's what the fundamental theorem of arithmetic states. It states that all these are going to be prime factors. So we can say that p of i and q of j are distinct prime numbers. So I'll just say they are distinct primes. Okay, so now that we've got that out of the way, we can use some quick algebra to kind of solve this for two. So we've already stated that the cube root of two is equal to the fraction p over q. And what we can do with this is we can cube both sides, right? So if we were to cube both sides, I would put this in parentheses and I would cube it. And I would put this fraction in parentheses and cube that. So then that's going to give us 2 is equal to p cubed over q cubed. OK? Now that we have that, what we can do is we can actually multiply both sides by the denominator in order to get p cubed by itself. So that's going to give us p cubed is equal to 2 times q cubed. All right. So now that I have this, I can replace p with our prime factorization that I have up here. So if p is equal to p1 to the alpha 1, p2 to the alpha 2, all the way to pn to the alpha n, 
what I can say is I can replace P with that characterization. So I'm basically going to have this. And all I'm doing is I'm replacing P with its prime factorization. And then I have to cube it, right? So the whole thing is going to be to the third power. And then I have the equal sign. I bring down the 2. And then I'm going to put the prime factorization of Q inside parentheses. So I'm going to have Q1 to the beta 1, Q2 to the beta 2, all the way to Qn to the beta n. And then this whole thing has to be cubed just like the Q cubed up here. Okay, so now that I have this, I can use exponent rules to simplify everything. And if everything is cubed inside the parentheses, then that means I can multiply all the exponents alpha by 3. So I'm going to get this. Uh, P1 to the 3 times alpha 1, P2 to the 3 times alpha 2, all the way to Pn to the 3 times alpha n power. Okay? And over on this side, I'm going to have that 2 out in front. It's not going to be cubed like everything inside parentheses. But now I can multiply all the beta exponents by 3. So I'm going to have Q1 to the 3 times beta 1. I'm going to have Q2 to the 3 times beta 2. And then all the way to Qn 3 times beta n. All right. So now we have to use uh, P1 and Q1, and we're going to assume that those are the prime number 2. So we're going to assume that the first prime number is 2, and the first prime number for the Q is also 2. Then we can say what? Well, uh, if the first prime number is 2, then how many 2's am I going to have based on the exponent? Uh, I can say that the number of 2's on the left side would be what? Well, if I were to look at this and multiply all the exponents by 3, then I could either have zero twos, right? Or if alpha one was just the number one, I would have three twos. Or if alpha one was two, then I would have six twos. Or if alpha one was three, I would have nine twos, right? Etc. Notice I'm just multiplying by three, right? That's what the 3 alpha 1 tells me. And then, what can we say about the number of 2's on this side? This is actually going to come into play right here. So we could say the number of 2's on the right side is what? Well, uh, since I have 3 beta 1, I, I would usually have 0, 3, 6, and 9, but I have an extra 2 right here. So I wouldn't have just 0 2's, I could have 1 of the 2's, I could have 4 of the 2's, I could have 7 of the 2's, and I can have 10 of the 2's, and so on. Notice that I'm basically just increasing by 3 each time. But because of this extra 2 right here, that's what makes this, you know, this number different. It's 2 on this side. So if the number of 2's on the left side is 0, 3, 6, 9, etc., and the number of 2's on the right side is going to be 1, 4, 7, 10, etc., then the number of 2's don't match up. So if the number of 2's don't match up, I can say thus p cubed is actually not equal to 
2 times q cubed. And notice that this is a contradiction because we assumed up here that these two sides were equal. Well, apparently they're not this time. So there's the contradiction. So what we started off with was we assumed that the cube root of 2 is rational. But due to the contradiction, it can't be rational. So if the cube root of 2 can't be rational, it must be irrational. So I can say, therefore, to finish off the proof, the cube root of 2 is irrational. That means that there's no way that I can write the cube root of 2 as a fraction. And there we go. I'll just kind of zoom out so you guys can get everything. Zoom out a little bit more. There we go. And that is the proof. So I hope that helps you guys out. Um, I know that the proof was kind of long, but this is a proof that's pretty important in number theory. And it basically just states that the cube root of 2 cannot be written as a fraction. And of course, there are a bunch of other numbers that can't be written as fractions. And these are called irrational. So I hope that helps.